Okay, so today we are going to continue in the animal kingdom looking at our invertebrates a little bit deeper. Um, and we are going to cover the phyla uh, Platyhelminthes, Annelida, and Nematoda today. So basically we're looking at worms today. That's what that means. So if we look at the phylogeny of things, um, where we're starting now is right in this section. So if you look at our worms, um, we're going to be looking at Annelida today, and we're going to be looking at flatworms today, um, and but we are also going to jump over here to our roundworms. So our roundworms are um, still protostomes, um, but we break that down into trochophores and lophophores, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but then we also additionally have our round worms. So that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at worms and they kind of branch across all that phylogeny. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, we are going to be staying in the triploblasts. That means it has three germ layers. And if you'll recall, those could be categorized as either protostomes or deuterostomes. So the protostomes, remember the mouth develops first. Um, from that blastopore, and that's where most of our invertebrates um, lie, and that's where we're staying today. So we're first going to look at a group called the Lophotrochozoans, and again, these are protostomes. They have bilateral symmetry, so you can cut them in definite right and left halves, and some of them have a true column. Remember, to be a true column, you had to have mesodermal lining um, the entire uh, cavity. Okay, so within our Lophotrochozoans, there are two different groups. There's the Lophophorans, which um, that just means crest, so that's what the body style, and then the Trochozoans, which is where we're going to remain, and that means wheeled, and you'll see why as we kind of go through them. But that includes our flatworms and our annelids that we're going to be talking about today. Um, when we get to phylum mollusca and we look at rotifers also, that's also included in this trochozoan group. Okay, we're going to start with our phylum platyhelminthes. And remember, these are the trochozoans, so they are said to be wheeled. And the reason um, that these are is if you look at their larvae, they have this band of cilia, and it as it goes, it looks like a wheel. Um, and so Platyhelminthes are our flatworms, and they have free-swimming larvae, as we said, and at, as adults, they have what's called an incomplete digestive system, which we've talked about before. That means only one opening um, that functions as the mouth and the anus as well, and this is uh, one of the model organisms in our flatworms. Um, this is called a planaria. And we'll talk um, a little bit in detail about that, but um, this is one of the free-living flatworms. So within our flatworms, um, here's our planaria at the bottom that we talked about, but there are many other options, including some marine um, flatworms as well. Um, and so they show signs of bilateral symmetry. Remember we talked about in animals, that's how we start to categorize um, different animals is based on their body symmetry. And so just bilateral, meaning we can split it in half and you have mirror images. Um, and then they also have these defined um, eye spots. So you can see them here or here. And these eye spots are really just photosensors. They aren't actual eyes. So they can sense which direction light is coming from. And then oftentimes they have these sensory lobes on the side. They're pretty clear here on our planaria, um, they're called oracles, um, and they're typically chemosensors that allows them to find their prey. So we break down our flatworms into three major classes. One is the planaria, and um, also includes marine flatworms, and then there's flukes and tapeworms. So our flatworms really come in two different types. We have free living or we have parasitic. And our lovely flatworm planaria that we were just looking at, um, those are free living. So we like them. They are not parasites. 
The second group are flukes and tapeworms. I think everybody's pretty much familiar with a tapeworm. Um, we, we will be looking at a little bit about that. These flukes are super, super flat. When they say flatworms, that's really what they mean. They almost, um, well, you'll see those in lab also. They're probably about two to three centimeters long, but they're very, very flat. So taking a slightly closer look at our planaria, um, they do live in fresh water. Note so far that most of the organisms that we've been talking about do either live in water or they need a moist environment. Um, so as we mentioned, they are free living and they feed kind of on small living or dead organisms. They can do either one. They have that bilateral symmetry. So pretty much if you cut right along here, then you have a left and a right half. They have pigmented eye spots, which you saw, they're so cartoon-like. And they do provide like a rudimentary sense of sight. But they also have what's called these auricles. That's these little bulges that stick out on either side. They kind of look like cheeks. And those are chemosensory and tactile um, cells that, that allows them to feel what's going on around them, to be able to move towards their uh, prey or away whatever they need to do, but that's how they sense their environment. So this is um, what your planaria looks like in their different systems, and we're going to quickly go through each of the four. Um, their digestive system, their nervous system, reproductive system, and then um, what's called the protonephridia. Okay? We're going to go through each of those. So let's talk about their digestive system. So even though they're these small, um, flat worms, the way that they eat their food is that they wrap themselves around their prey. Remember, it can be a living or a dead organism. And then they entangle it with this slime that they produce. And then the, the pharynx um, of our lovely worm, which is located right here, actually comes out through its mouth and then ingests the um, organism and brings it back in. So in this image right here, it has the gastrovascular cavity stained this darker color. So all of these branches that you see, that's part of their gastrovascular cavity and nutrients and oxygen are delivered through that gastrovascular system. Um, so they don't necessarily have, they don't have lungs like we do, so that oxygen gets delivered that way. And then the waste exits back out the mouth because of course it is an incomplete digestive system. Okay, so when we're looking at the protonephridia, um, this is where this organism is going to do osmoregulation as well as um, ionic regulation. So it's different from the digestive system. It, remember we said the digestive system was incomplete, which meant it only had one hole that works as the mouth and the anus. So this is separate from that. This is looking at um, waste of osmoregulation. Uh, and it's a set of canal systems that run throughout the body. You can see those all through here. And towards the end of each one, um, there will be a flame cell, and it's literally called that because it looks like a flame. It's kind of like the bulbous end. Um, and there are, it's filled with cilia that allows fluid movement to come through here. Um, and then across those cilia is where we have water and ionic movement. And then any, any excess that we need to get rid of then comes out this excretory pore. And note that these canals um, don't ever connect to the digestive system. Okay, what about its reproductive system? So actually, planaria do reproduce sexually. Um, so they are what's called monoecious, or sometimes that's called hermaphroditic, but most people don't use that term anymore. Monoecious means uh, one body itself that contains both male and female parts. So the mono being one, one body contains both male and female parts. 
And um, again with the pen, I'm telling you. All right. So if we look here, we see that we that our one little planaria has oviducts. It has testes and ovaries. So both male and female, it has a penis and it has a genital pore. So it can reproduce sexually. Now it can also reproduce asexually and the regeneration um, comes from the tail portion if it's decapitated and look how quickly it does this. So in 14 days you have a full new planaria. Again this is of huge interest to the medical field because it'd be great to know how the planaria does this. Can it be applied uh, to human tissue or not? Um, but it's just really fascinating that it can do that. The nervous system of the planaria is very simple. So it's what we call a ladder type of nervous system and that's just what it sounds like, right? It has ladder structures. So it has paired ganglia up here that serve as like a primitive brain and then all down the length of the body there's these lateral nerves on either side and then the transverse nerves that act like the rungs of a ladder all the way across. So very simple nervous system but it works for uh, the planaria. It's such a small body and simple and I just wanted to point out here um, we'll look at it again the gastrovascular cavity and you can note that it does tend to run along the same lines as the uh, ladder nervous system but here it has like all these branching points that come out and just so you can see here is the mouth which is sort of in the center of the body, not something we're used to, right? And this, in this image, the pharynx is extended out of the mouth. And that would be where it goes and um, then can ingest its prey. Okay, so now we have looked at our free living flatworms, our free li living worms within phylum platyhelminthes. Now we're going to switch gears and go over to our parasitic flatworms. So they are still characteristically very flat, but now we're going to look at our parasitic types. So our parasitic flatworms are included in the class Trematoda and class Cestoda, and those are nestled under the phylum Platyhelminthes. And so like most parasitic organisms, um, the flatworms have a protective covering on the outside of their body and this is called a tegument and that tegument protects them if they live like in the digestive system of organisms like we'll see um, it protects them from di those digestive juices now these parasitic flatworms have no cephalization so they don't have the ganglia that we did see in um, our planaria and then they have a specialized anterior end that has hooks that allows it to um, attach to its um, host. And then like most parasitic organisms, it has a very well-developed reproductive system. It can produce lots and lots and lots um, of eggs. So the first one that we talked about in our phylum uh, Trematoda those are the flukes and our example of that is what's called schistosoma and um, this is basically the life cycle of a schistosoma and it has two hosts um, the primary being um, a snail and the second one being humans so let's take a look at that just a little bit um, to begin with Here's our larvae down here. We're going to start with number four. Um, oops, number four. Here's our ciliated larvae. And it hatches in water. And so just for you to get an idea of where this takes place, um, it's in warm climates with lots of water, lots of rainfall. And so it's very common in rice paddies, for instance. So once the larvae um, hatches, then it enters its first host, which is a snail. 
And once it's in the snail, um, it can develop lots of daughter sporocytes because remember we said this is very uh, good at reproduction. So over and over again, um, we're gonna have lots and lots of new larvae. So that larvae breaks out of its daughter sporocyte and it enters into the snail's digestive system and then back into the water. At this stage, that larvae can then penetrate the skin of a human. And once it does, it matures inside of the human and lives um, and reproduces in the blood vessels of the human gut. Okay, which is, if you know all about your digestive system, it has a lot of blood vessels. And then as it lays eggs, the eggs um, migrate into the digestive tract and are packed, uh, passed back into feces. So this is where we get into sanitation because a lot of times in these rice patties, then human fecal matter is getting back into the water and the cycle starts all over again. So then as we move into class Cestoda, these are gonna be our tapeworms, something you're probably more used to hearing about. We know that they can um, attach into your digestive tract and they really do absorb the nutrients from their host, um, which is what usually causes the most damage, um, making uh, malnutrition a huge issue for people who have um, tapeworms within their digestive tract. So they um, can grow up to 20 meters in length, which is huge. Um, and they do have that modified head, and that modified head is what we call a scolex, that's seen right here. And notice all these hooks right here, that's what they use to attach to your digestive system. They are hermaphroditic, or again, that word monoecious, and each of the reproductive units is called a proglottid. Okay, so here um, in this image on the left, each of these units is called a proglottid, and that's where it contains the male and female organ, uh, organs. So you see the ovaries and the testes, and remember again, this, these are monoecious, both male and female on the same organism. Um, and so as they mature and you have fertilization occurring, these individual segments, the proglottids, then start to disintegrate and then we have this whole section and we call that a gravid body and that's when it's full of mature eggs and you can see the enormous amount of eggs here like we said they are well developed in their reproductive system and they will produce hundreds of thousands of eggs so here is the life cycle of our tapeworm and again it has two hosts so to start with let's start here um, in their adult phase um, they can be attached to our digestive system. Um, once they have the gravid bodies, um, then they lay eggs in your digestive system, and then it is excreted um, out through feces, gets into groundwater, that sort of thing. And then either pigs or cows will ingest the vegetation that's contaminated with those eggs. And then as it goes through their digestive system, then it starts to um, hatch and penetrate the intestinal wall. And then through the circulatory system, it invades their muscle, cyst, uh, their muscle tissue. And they develop these little cysts that kind of encase them into the muscle tissue. And then if we um, then eat any meat from pigs or cows, we then ingest those and then they can grow back into adults again. So the key here is that this is in raw or uncooked meat that's been infected because again, it's in that muscle tissue. And so that's why oftentimes in restaurants, they won't allow you to have uh, raw or rare beef or pork because of this um, potential infestation. So in order to get rid of those, we have to cook them above a cer certain temperature and then that kills out these cysts. Okay, so let's look here at um, bringing us back to this slide. We are still in the trochozoans, so they still have some wheeled um, 
form to them and we have covered flatworms, free living and parasitic. Now we're going to move on to um, the annelids or annelida. Glad to um, be talking about them. These are what we, uh, annelida means little rings um, and they are, are segmented worms. So each um, body has, contains segments and that's really easy to see in our earthworms. You see these little rings right here, which means that they are broken down into segments. Um, so this includes our earthworms. It includes leeches, which are right here and um, some marine worms as well. Um, they are the only trochozoans with segmentation and they have a well-developed colon. So that's new for this group. Um, they have what we call seti, which are bristles that protrude from the body wall. And we'll see later, but you can see them right here. They're very well-developed in this um, marine worm. And earthworms have them as well. That's how they actually move, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, because of these seti, we, d we divide our annelids into two groups. If they only have a few seti, they're called oligocates. If they have lots of them, they're called polycates. So let's start with our uh, earthworm. It's the perfect example of an annelid. Uh, we call it Lumbricus terrestris, and it is an oligocate. And the reason for that is because it has few setae per segment. Um, and they are scavengers, meaning they can pretty much eat anything in the soil just about. Um, and again, because they're annelids, they are segmented. The segmentation is visible externally, as you can see on this particular um, earthworm. And of course, it's also segmented internally, as we talked about. It's divided by the septa, which are sort of like, mm, kind of like walls in between each segment. Okay, so looking at it um, up close, this is what the anatomy of the earthworm looks like, and that's gonna be important. So this has a complete digestive system. So it starts here, it has a mouth and a pharynx. Um, unlike the planaria, it, it has a digestive system that runs the entire length of the body and therefore has an anus as well. Wow, I can't follow this very well. Um, so that's what makes it a complete digestive system, it, it, that it has the entire tube, two holes, um, so a complete digestive system. Um, as food moves through, it comes down and it hits a crop and a gizzard. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, particularly in lab. And then, um, <laughs> the intestines run the length of the body. So that's its digestive system. Its nervous system, it has a vent, uh, sorry, a ventral nerve cord, and it also has, um, I'm sorry, it has no dorsal nerve cord, but only a ventral nerve cord. And then of course it has um, little branching off of that. It's a very thin body, so it doesn't require a whole lot. Um, and that's also true of the, um, the sorry, the, the circulatory system. It has a dorsal blood vessel and a ventral blood vessel and then branches off of that. Um, for reproduction, it has seminal vesicles right here that are next to, oh, I forgot to say that. It also has um, what's called uh, basically we call them hearts, they're more like heart-like things, um, and they have five pairs of those. And they do work to pump the blood, so that's part of their circulatory system. So earthworms live in a moist environment because um, the way that it gets its oxygen, note that it didn't have lungs, is through diffusion through the skin, and that diffusion always has to take place across a wet surface. So as it diffuses across, then it can be transmitted throughout the body through the circulatory system. Okay, so let's look at this in cross section just a little bit. Um, so we talked about the nervous system. Here is our ventral nerve cord. Remember, we don't have a dorsal nerve cord just yet. 
Um, and keeping in mind that this eventually leads to the um, simple brain that is um, at the anterior end. Um, and then as far as our circulatory system, we have uh, a ventral blood vessel, and then we also have a dorsal blood vessel. And of course, there's also a subneural blood vessel as well right down here. Keeping in mind um, that something you're seeing different now than what we've seen before is that we have a circulatory system that is enclosed in vessels. So it's not just relying on um, diffusion to circulate uh, waste and nutrients. Now we have an actual circulatory system. So that is an advantage uh, that the annelids have, particularly the earthworm. Um, and then on top of that, we also have uh, the nephridia here that we talked about functions similarly to a kidney, um, helps with osmoregulation and ionic regulation. Um, it does have a complete salomic lining. So this would be our coelomate. And then um, one thing I just want to point out, uh, because it will help us understand movement, is that our earthworm has longitudinal muscles as well as circular muscles. Okay, let's look at the movement of an earthworm. Remember I told you those muscles were pretty important um, in their movement, and so are the seti, or what in this image they're calling bristles. So um, assuming that this is the head and this is the direction we want to move in, um, first we have our circular um, relaxed muscles right here. And while they're relaxed, our longitudinal muscles are contracting, pulling this portion of the body in together. Now, while that's happening, a little bit further back, our circular muscles are contracted or pulled in, and when they do that, they pull the seti into the body, so it's, it's not digging into the ground anymore. At the same time, the longitudinal muscles are relaxed. So that's letting that body um, portion pull in and let the seti out while um, this first section is anchored in and, and pulling the rest of the body in this direction. So it bunches up. Then after that, then that same portion here can then relax and spread out and then we contract the next section and so on and so forth. So we have a general movement in this direction. And that's why the seti along with the longitudinal and circular muscles all work in combination to move our earthworm forward. Okay, so let's talk about the reproduction um, of earthworms. So earthworms are hermaphrodites. Um, that means that they have both male and female organs. We can also call that monoecious. So one animal that has both male and female parts. Um, but having both of those parts, they don't fertilize themselves, so no self-fertilization. So they do require two different organisms. So for sexual reproduction, we need to talk about one particular part of the worm, and it's right here. You can see how it's enlarged. This is what's called the clitellum. So, the way this takes place is the worms lay parallel to one another, but opposite. So you can see that the clitellum is in two separate orientations. And that clitellum secretes a mucus that keeps things moist. So as the sperm is released, um, if you recall, it has a flagella, so it has to swim. That requires um, a moist environment. So the clitellum um, secretes that mucus to allow the, the sperm to swim. Um, and once the worms are separated, that clitellum produces a what we call a slime tube. And that's where the egg and sperm um, are deposited and fertilization occurs. Then that slime tube becomes a cocoon or a protective um, measure for the hatched worms until they mature. So that clitellum is really important in the sexual reproduction of earthworms. 
Now, I had a student one time tell me after I got done saying that, they're like, you make that sound so sexy. Well, that's just the silliest thing I've ever heard, but there you go. Worm sex for today. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the ecological importance of earthworms. Um, you know, they kind of form the base of a lot of food chains. They get eaten by uh, birds, fish, um, all kinds of critters. But they're very important to the soil because they aerate it by all the holes that they dig. They allow oxygen into the soil. And when we get to plants and we talk about soil, you're going to realize that that's extremely important. Um, and they just mix the soil. Some by Just by moving up and down in the soil column, they are mixing the soil. And, um, of course, they help to cycle nutrients because, as we said, they're scavengers. They pretty much eat anything. And then as they poop, um, that we call it uh, their cast because that sounds so much better. Um, that is putting nutrients back into the soil. So if you have earthworms, you generally have very good soil for gardening. In fact, um, I went to a place called the Hike Inn, um, which is at the beginning of the Appalachian Trail in Georgia. It's actually a really lovely little inn. But they do all vermiculture. So what vermiculture is, is composting, but using earthworms. So they had these long tables, and any time you had leftover food from dinner, it would be put in there, and there's no smell to it because the earthworms digest it really fast and nice and cleanly, so then they just have all this beautiful dark soil, which they then used to grow beautiful flowers and vegetables and it was just a lovely process to be honest um never seen something so clean in my life and the owner of the hike in did say that one time they put a pair of levi's in there and in a week the worms had eaten everything except for the zipper and the buttons so so they are quite efficient um but they are really important for our soil and i had to include this as a fisherwoman what do I think of when I think of earthworms? Bass fishing. And it's about that time of year. Um, I don't know when you're listening to this, but it's spring and it is perfect bass um, fishing season. So that is what I think of. If any of you are fishermen, you probably thought the same thing. Okay, so let's take a look at where we've been and where we're going keeping everything together here. So we're still in our protostomes, right? Um, and we were looking in our Lophotrochozoa, and particularly we have looked at the Platyhelminthes. That's where our flatworms were. We just looked at our annelids, um, and that were, that, sorry, that's where our earthworms live, our segmented worms. And then now we're gonna look at a different kind of worm called the nematodes. These are our roundworms. Um, so they are still protostomes, but they have branched off right here. And so I just wanted to let you look at that for a moment so that you know that we're not in the same group. We're not in the Lophotrochozoas anymore. So let's move on to our nematodes. So now we're going to move on to our roundworms. These are in the phylum Nematoda, so we call them nematodes. And like I said, their physical nature is that they are round, but unlike the annelids, they are non-segmented. So they don't have little lines or rings like you see in the annelids. They are smooth and round. And this is actually the most numerous multicellular organism that we have. Um, and the fact that they have an outer cuticle as a protective covering ought to tell you that there are many of them that are parasitic. That's kind of your hint for that. And they do have a pseudocelum, which either means that, it, that it's incomplete or it's not completely lined with mesodermal cells. Um, we, there are many that are free living, but there are quite a few that are parasitic. And the examples that we're gonna be looking at today are Ascaris. And Ascaris um, is something that infects uncooked vegetables. Um, and in its um, host, it will block bile ducts, which causes lots of stomach problems. Um, our second is filarial worms, which is uh, heartworms for dogs. If you have a dog and are giving them heartworm medication, it's to prevent this. And then the third is a pinworm, which is the most common nematode in the U.S. 
just a little bit more about them. Um, their respiration is through diffusion. So far, that's pretty much what we've been seeing um, with most of our organisms. I've already said they're pseudocolumates. Um, they, however, have a complete digestive system, which is different from the flatworms, um, but similar to the annelids. So they have a mouth and an anus. Um, and then they also have a nerve ring around their pharynx, which contains four ganglia. Um, and then the interesting thing about them is that they only have longitudinal muscles. Um, and I'm going to show you why that's important in a minute. Um, and then what we call a hydrostatic skeleton, which basically means they contain a lot of water in their body, and that's how they remain turgid. Okay, why are the longitudinal muscles so important? Okay, let's say that I have a worm, and I only have muscles that run this way. Well, if I were to contract this side right here, then my worm is going to be shaped a little more like this. And then I can do that on the other side, and it's going to be like this. And that is the only way that nematodes have to move. So when you look at um, their motion, it's kind of like a whip-looking fashion because they can only uh, crunch to the one side and then crunch to the other side. And that's how they move. Well, okay, I wasn't going to go straight to that, I didn't think, but there you go. Um, so this is what heartworms look like in a dog. Um, obviously, this is a parasitic uh, roundworm. And so I am old enough to remember when we had dogs who, um, they didn't make heartworm pills just yet. And so my first dog died of heartworms. Um, by the time I got my second dog, they started having tablets that dogs could take. They must have been terrible tasting because I know my dog hated it, but... We always got it down him anyway, just in case. Okay, so this is not what you want to see when you come to class. I know that. These are pinworms, and if you really want to know what this picture is of, it's an anus. So pinworms are in the U.S. Um, very common in preschool settings um, because they are passed um, through fecal matter. So I'm just going to tell you how it is. When you have little kids going to the bathroom, they're not great at, at, at wiping. They get it on their hands. They're not great at washing their hands either, I might add. And, you know, preschoolers tend to suck their thumb, suck their fingers, or, you know, so it's easily transmitted um, between kids at that age. And so typically speaking, um, it makes them itch, so of course they're scratching their cute little heinies, but then they have it all on their fingers, and again, like I said, they suck their fingers or they touch things and other kids suck their fingers, so very transmissible in the preschool age. So I know it's gross, it happens. So if you learn nothing else today from this lecture, know that your mother was right. Always wash your hands, always wash your hands. And then we'll just also add and cook your meat thoroughly. So that is our segment on invertebrates, particularly worms. And um, <laughs> hopefully not everything we talk about will be gross. But I did have one student in lab, kind of by the time we got done with worms, she was like, can we stop looking at gross things in lab now? <laughs> so there's my fair warning. Until we're done with worms, you probably won't think we're done with gross things. But um, we'll see you next time.